You're listening to The World at Eight with Lynn Mozart. The World at Eight, the number one in nationalist news. Highlights of the news today, Friday the 12th of April. Can the Cubans help our weight in the UK? Repeat sex offenders films repeated rape of 11-year-old schoolgirl. Bromley PCSO jail for child sex offences. Bridge End Council leaves young girl with convicted paedophile to be abused. France has no choice but to freeze benefits. Spanish homes and Greek jobs. Mali gives a land new camel after the first one eaten. Nick Griffin MEP on home territory today. Germany, Islam becomes campaign issue. Sweden, police allow prayer calls at Stockholm Mosque. Anonymous, threatened to unmask boys who drove 17-year-old girl to hang herself. Thought for the day, bits and pieces and bits and pieces. And finally, a hamster, ascension or nearly. It's been reported in the Daily Mail that, surprise, surprise, Researchers appear to have implied that people can lose weight during a recession due to reduction in eating and increased physical activity. Their dramatic findings, published online in the British Medical Journal, were based on a study in Cuba where the population suffered food and fuel shortages following the economic crisis of the early 1990s, triggered by the collapse of the Soviet Union. This resulted in an average of 4 to 5 kilograms, 8 to 11 pounds, being shed by the people and subsequent rapid declines in deaths from diabetes and coronary heart disease. The scientists from the University of Aklala in Madrid also discovered that when Cubans put the weight back on, cases of diabetes surged again. The conclusion is that the Cuban crisis could have lessons in Britain. World Day, it says, poppycock, we had that lesson during the last war in this country. People were much healthier immediately after the war than they are now. It's a well-known fact that lessening calories and sugar helps reduce many diseases. Although getting blown to bits isn't an added bonus. Repeat sex offender films repeated rape of 11-year-old schoolgirl. Jurors at the Old Bailey are hearing the case of Opamipo Jaji, 18. Jaji is accused of raping an 11-year-old schoolgirl in a park in Enfield. He's alleged to have followed the 11-year-old as she made her way home from school last November. After repeatedly raping the girl, he bragged he would show a video of the attack to her family and friends. The repeated rape required the girl to undergo an operation for her injuries. Rosina Cottage QC, prosecuting, said Jaji had an interest in prepubescent girls. The previous year, Jaji had pleaded guilty to sexually assaulting and robbing another girl dressed in her school uniform. Bromley PCSO Billy Wheatley jailed for child sex offences. Billy Wheatley, 25, of Woodlands Avenue, a police community support officer, was found to have been in possession of 69,000 vile, indecent photographs of children when he was arrested in September 13th last year. A thorough examination of his computer uncovered mobile phone footage of a girl aged around five or six being sexually assaulted by Wheatley. A further nine movies of young children that appeared to be taken by Wheatley wearing a secret camera were also found. Wheatley, who was arrested in November 23rd, identified the young girl in the film and admitted assaulting her on two occasions. He also admitted assaulting the girl's older brother, who was aged 13 or 14 at the time. Officers later found that Wheatley had continued to access and make indecent images of children whilst he had been on bail after his initial arrest. On February 19th, Wheatley admitted one count of indecent assault, two counts of assault on a child, sexual assault on a child and voyeurism. He also pleaded guilty to three counts of taking indecent photos of a child and ten counts of making indecent photos of a child, including some at the most severe level. Wheatley was sentenced to a total of five and a half years. Wheatley has since resigned from his position as PCSO. World Date says... This man is not a person for whom rehabilitation is possible. Chemical or actual castration for these perverts should be the norm, not prison or mental homes. Raping children under 10 and babies should have its own special category of punishment and zero tolerance. Bridge End Council leaves young girl with convicted paedophile to be abused. Wales Online reports the case of Child S. Bridge End Council left Child S, who was under the age of 13, in the care of a convicted paedophile. 
A serious case review, SCR, was undertaken following allegations of abuse from Child S in 2009. The SCR said social services closed the case five months later, despite the convicted child sex offender refusing a National Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Children risk assessment. Child S was returned to her mother's home in July 2010. She confided in a neighbour about the alleged sexual abuse by the family member. The SCR said the neighbour told social services about the allegations, but no action was taken. A protection review for siblings of Child S who were living at their mum's home flagged the carer's past convictions. But social services completed a core assessment on the girl's welfare and concluded... The male carer posed little or no risk to the young person and it was assessed that the young person was able to self-protect and wanted the arrangement to continue. The case was then closed to social services. Police agreed with the social worker's decision according to a timeline published alongside the SCR. In Bridgend County Borough there had been 13 SCRs over the past four years. In March, Wales Online reported on an SCR into the case of Child P, a 16-year-old from Mastag, Apologies to the Welsh speakers, who died from a drugs overdose after years of alleged sexual abuse. It's said she was failed by police and social services. Bridge End MP Madeline Moon said, This is a second sad case of a child failed by professionals who should have used their training skills and networks to protect them. This case shows serious failures to protect a pre-teenage child from sexual abuse. As with child P, too great a responsibility was placed on the child to self-protect from sexual abuse and exploitation. World to date states, If thumping great 14-year-olds can't protect themselves from rape, what chance does a small child stand? European news. France has no choice but to freeze benefits. French central bank governor Christian Noyer said on Wednesday that France should freeze pensions, civil servant salaries and social benefits to save €40 billion Euros by 2014 as it tries to cut a swollen public deficit and jumpstart growth. Noyer told Europe One Radio that France, to reach the EU deficit limit of 3.0% of gross domestic product, had to have the same level of spending in 2014 as in 2012. Since spending would normally increase on its own by 40 billion euros, we have to find 40 billion in savings, he noted. That would require an effort across the board and specifically that meant freezing pensions and extending a freeze on civil servant salaries and social benefits. We are not in austerity. Generally speaking, we don't have any choice. World Today says, Sounds like austerity to me. If it walks like a duck, talks like a duck and looks like a duck, it must be a duck. Spanish homes and Greek jobs. Spanish home values plummet. The EU statistical office Eurostat said the price of houses in Spain fell 12.8% in the fourth quarter of 2012 when compared to the same period in 2011. It's the largest drop amongst member states followed by Romania at minus 9.1% and Slovenia at minus 8.8%. Latvia registered the highest increase. Greek joblessness on the rise. The Hellenic Statistical Authority on Thursday said 27.2% of Greeks were unemployed in January, up from 21.5% the same time last year. Some 3.6 million people have work, while 1.3 million people are jobless and 3.3 million people are inactive. Around 34% in the 25 to 34 age groups are unemployed. World of Date says... With a population of 10.8 million, 1.3 million jobless and 3.3 million inactive, that sounds to me a hell of a lot closer to 50% rather than 27% unemployment. Strict rules mean that just 225,000 Greeks receive state assistance. We used to jail accountants for being that creative. Well, if it sounds like a duck, would you know the rest? Mali gives Hollande new camel after first one eaten. Things have not been going well for French President François Hollande as of late. His approval ratings already abysmally low, Hollande's leadership was called into question last week after his government became embroiled in a tax scandal. To add insult to injury, it was also reported on World Date that the baby camel he was given as thanks for France's military intervention in Mali was slaughtered and eaten by the family meant to care for it in Timbuktu. But there seems to be a small silver lining in the storm cloud that has settled over Hollande's presidency. Embarrassed over the whole camel business, 
Malian authorities are set to give the French leader an even better dromedary to replace the one that was devoured. As soon as we heard this, we quickly replaced it with a bigger and better looking camel, said the local government official, quoted by the Reuters news agency. The new camel will be sent to Paris. We're ashamed of what happened to the camel. It was a present that didn't deserve this fate. World Today it says, Things are getting tough in France, and maybe your land will give this camel to some deserving family in one of the outlying arrondissements, but don't be surprised at the menu for the next French state dinner. The poor beast should be sent to live in a nice zoo away from people who like camel meat. I now hand you over to Nick Griffin, MEP, who is today on the home front. So goodbye, Margaret Thatcher. Adored and hated, but never ignored. Your people thought you a saint or a demon, but never an uninstantly. A remarkable figure has passed from the British political stage. Her greatest hour, surely, was the triumph of the brave British forces who liberated the Falkland Islands. It's almost certainly true that no other UK Prime Minister in recent times would have had the courage to launch such a desperate gamble on behalf of a couple of thousand British citizens so far away. She rolled the dice, she inspired and she won. Fair play to the woman. Although it is true that the lives lost could have been saved if Mrs Thatcher had acted so resolutely some months earlier because it was her government's penny-pinching decision to withdraw the last Antarctic supply vessel, HMS Endurance, that led the Argentinians to conclude that Britain would not go to war over the islands in the first place. It's a little odd saying anything good about a politician who is so divisive and destructive. Margaret Thatcher is remembered for handbagging EU ministers in order to bludgeon a rebate back from Britain's massive financial contribution to the EU. But earlier in her career, Never forget that she was an enthusiastic supporter of the undemocratic European project. I campaigned for British freedom and withdrawal as a young nationalist in the 1975 common market referendum. Margaret Thatcher campaigned to keep Britain in, wearing a truly hideous jumper, emblazoned with the flags of those nations already caught in the Europhile's web of deceit, Britain included. She was an enthusiastic supporter of EU economic integration, And of course, it was Prime Minister Thatcher who in 1987 signed the Single European Act, the landmark treaty on which subsequent EU integration is founded. Her followers seek to excuse this on the grounds that she later protested that she was misled as to its meaning. Unfortunately for that argument, ignorance is no defence in English law. Thatcher's signing of the Single European Act was treason, full stop. If it was the result of careless incompetence, It was arguably not quite the same as that committed by other enthusiastic Euro traitor premiers, such as Heath and Blair. But does a woman who signed away a vast chunk of a thousand years of freedom in some sort of bad hair day, fit of absent mindedness, really deserve the reputation of being a brave and far sighted Euro sceptic? I don't think so. Margaret Thatcher was largely responsible for the creation of banksterism. It was she who deregulated the city of London letting the banking foxes loose in the British economic hencoop, with disastrous results for which we are only just beginning to pay and for which our grandchildren will still be paying decades hence. In economic terms, she was not a traditional conservative at all. Margaret Thatcher was a 19th century free trade liberal. Her central role in destroying Britain's manufacturing base and social cohesion was not an accident. It was the direct and deliberate result of her application of archaic liberal dogma to real life. The price is still being paid by the hopeless young men committing suicide by heroin in the former pit villages and steel towns of Northern England, Wales and Scotland. When you buy Polish or Brazilian coal, despite living on an island still built on top of hundreds of years worth of the stuff, that's Maggie's legacy too. The poisonous legacy of Thatcher's anti-British policies also lingers in Northern Ireland, for it was good old Maggie who signed the Anglo-Irish Agreement and began the process that has put unrepentant IRA murderers in power instalment and set the loyalist community on the road to second class status and cultural genocide. Nor can I look at the humanitarian disaster unfolding in Zimbabwe and South Africa without remembering good old Maggie's central role in handing Rhodesia over to Marxist terrorists, thus sealing the fate 
for two white European nations, which have been our staunchest allies in two world wars. I'm sorry if I'm out of step with the wasn't she a wonderful conservative consensus, but let's continue with the home truths. Mrs Thatcher was an enthusiastic supporter of liberalisation on homosexuality and mass abortion. She was as responsible as its labour enthusiasts for the comprehensive education blight that has condemned millions of working class youngsters to a substandard education and destroyed social mobility for most of Britain. Margaret Thatcher sowed the seeds of Scottish devolution, which will almost certainly result in the breakup of the United Kingdom. There is no doubt that joke companies like British Leyland needed sorting out, and Maggie did so with gusto. Yet there is a difference between pushing through genuinely needed reforms and modernising British industry, as needed doing, and destroying it, which is what she did. Margaret Thatcher's policy of selling off council houses to create a property owning democracy wasn't a million miles in some ways from her own nationalist ideals of distributism. And if the failing old industries had been revived with a parallel move towards worker ownership, then something remarkable would have been achieved. But instead, while Maggie helped to distribute home ownership, her policies led to the even greater concentration of industrial ownership in even fewer hands or to the extinction of industrial production altogether. Even her council house selling policy contained a terrible flaw. Had the money raised been used to build more council houses, then homelessness would have been done away with by now. As she forbade it, the policy ended up creating today's massive housing shortage and the vast gulf between owner occupiers and those who have to rent. And yet, having said all that, and despite all her heinous mistakes, that have come home and are still coming home to roost. Margaret Thatcher still towers over her contemporaries and today's smug, petty, venal political elite. Because she did what she believed was right. With no thought of personal gain, no cynical gerrymandering, no playing to the gallery, well, not that much, and no parliamentary short-termism in order to limp through to the next election at any cost. Rather, she oozed leadership, integrity, and absolute faith in her own capabilities the fact that she was right, even though she often wasn't. She personified the difference between a politician and a statesman. One thinks only about the next election, the other about the next generation, even if the thinking's wrong. Britain was a joke in the 1970s. We were rightly referred to as the sick man of Europe, as having the British disease. But in fact, we were just a laughing stock to be pitied and despised in equal measure as overambitious, politically motivated union leaders led their members by the nose to demand ever greater, ever more outrageous wage increases for less productivity, while an inept management cowered in their shadow. And none of the pundits discussing those times in recent days have mentioned the fact that the unrest of those days wasn't just about money. The union movement was dominated by committed communists who were trained and funded by and dedicated to the cause of Soviet communism. Their aim was simple to use natural worries about rampant inflation to turn British workers into the unwilling shock troops of a step-by-step -step communist revolution in Britain. Anyone who was seriously politically involved in the mid-70s will remember the conviction we all had on all sides of the political spectrum that without a radical turnaround, Britain was on the slippery slope to communist domination. Labour MPs at the time still maintained that the thousands of Polish army officers found murdered in the forest of Katyn had been butchered by the Nazis, when everyone in Poland, and indeed the world, knew that the crime was a Soviet one, because that was what communists did when they took power, and they were gaining power in Britain. Even as us young nationalists were fighting communist activists toe-to-toe -to -toe on the streets of Britain, it was obvious the Reds were getting the upper hand. In the end, our bloody knuckles didn't stop them. Margaret Thatcher did. So yes, she conned the electorate into thinking she'd stop immigration and then let it carry on. And yes, she was the main player in the disastrous deindustrialization of Britain and the privatisation looting of what remained. Yes, she blew the North Sea oil bonanza and let multinational oil giants rob us of our greatest natural windfall ever. And yes, she screwed the British working class. In fact, in many ways, some deliberately, many inadvertently, she screwed Britain. I say inadvertently because I really don't believe that when Margaret Thatcher set about relieving the taxpayer 
of the burden of the horrendously inefficient utilities that she envisaged them being subsequently owned by foreigners and state owned foreigners at that. It was the law of unintended consequences. She never envisaged them any more than she would have willed Rolls Royce and Bentley to the Germans or Land Rover and Jaguar to the Indians. But the road to hell is paved with good intentions, isn't it, Mrs. T? You know that now for sure. But as her earthly remains are to be laid to rest, if you have a sneaking or a warm regard for Margaret Thatcher's personal coverage, add to that heartfelt thanks for her absolutely central role in stemming and reversing the communist tide before that brutal, anti-human, alien creed imposed on Britain the terror and the horror that it stamped onto the nations of Eastern and Central Europe. Ironically, Margaret Thatcher's greatest legacy is invisible. It's non-existent. It's the fact that here in Britain, we do not have any memorials to the slaughtered victims of communist tyranny because we don't need them here. And for that, if nothing else, Margaret Thatcher truly deserves gratitude and recognition. We will not see her likes again. Thank God. Thank you, Nick. It was good to hear a mannerly nationalistic view. World news. Germany, Islam becomes campaign issue. Germany's opposition Social Democrats are courting disgruntled Muslim voters in a desperate bid to unseat German Chancellor Angela Merkel in federal elections set for September the 22nd. Pierre Steinbrook, the 66-year-old Chancellor candidate for the centre-left Social Democrat Party, said at the campaign stop in Berlin on April the 3rd that he supported the idea of physical education classes in German schools being divided by gender as a courtesy to Muslims. The reaction to Steinbrook's comments was immediate and fierce from across Germany's political spectrum, an indication that overt support for multiculturalism may actually be a political liability in this election cycle. Barbara John, a politician with the ruling centre-right Christian Democrats, said the debate over gender separation is outmoded and that children and parents have to get used to the fact that genders here grow up together and live with the same rights. Sweden. Please allow prayer calls at Stockholm Mosque. A mosque in the south of Stockholm was given the all-clear by Swedish police on Thursday to make prayer calls from its minaret, the first time such permission has been ever granted in the country. The Stockholm police ruled that the call to prayer would be allowed for between three to five minutes on Fridays between midday and 1pm. I'm happy, very happy, Ismail Okur, chairman of the Botkikra Islamic Association, told Sveriges Radio. In September, the Botkikra Municipalities City Planning Committee voted in favour of scrapping a 1994 prohibition on allowing prayer calls, which dates back from before the construction of the mosque. The mosque was built in 2007 on the municipality's Fitcher district and has over 1,500 members. No date has been set for the first call to prayer. Anonymous threatened to unmask boys who drove 17-year-old girl to hang herself. Anonymous has vowed to expose the identities of the four boys behind the rape of a 17-year-old girl who killed herself after they circulated a photograph of the assault. Retta Parsons was raped by four classmates when she was 15. They took a photo of the attack and circulated around the school. Classmates and friends shunned her and she was forced to leave the school. Police investigated but didn't press charges due to insufficient evidence. Retta hanged herself in her family's bathroom last week after months of torment and on Sunday night her parents took her off life support. Hackers said it took them two hours to find two of the boys linked to the death of the girl. The hacking collective said that they knew who two of the supposed culprits were and that they were confirming the identity of a third before putting them on the internet. In the post, the group added that it was only a matter of time before they got the fourth as well. Anonymous said that it took action after police in Nova Scotia, Canada, charged nobody over the death of Rayta Parsons. There were also no charges for any of the boys for sending the pictures to their friends. Our demands are simple. We want the NA Nova Scotia RCMP to take immediate legal action against the individuals in question. World Date says, for once this is an action Anonymous is taking, with which I agree. In late breaking news, CBS in America confirms that Anonymous has now made contact with all four of the boys involved and plan to release the names of the four boys if no action is taken by law enforcement officials.
Talk for the day, bits and pieces, bits and pieces. I'm in bits and pieces mode today, so if I change topics, don't worry, it's the nature of the beast. Unions. The reason why British Labour went AWOL in Britain was Labour unions. The reason why American Labour went AWOL in America was Labour unions. The reason why all the countries that all our industries and Labour went to do not have Labour unions, one reason apart from the fact that their people want to work, is that they be shot. On immigration, don't the government realise that even if they step up to the mark and actually just cap immigration to the UK, it could be too late? Even if we were in power and stopped it tomorrow, there are still enough immigrants in this country to one, outbreed us in 10 years, and two, finish off state health, education and the benefit system as we know it. For those liberal lovies out there, England, a small island in the Northern Hemisphere, has already lost its capital city London, and all the major towns and cities north of the Thames are already majority ethnically populated. And we are the minority. It isn't for nothing that even the public school Marxists are getting windy over the subject of immigration, so near even the local elections, because they've backed the wrong horse there. And if you think that Cameron will do anything positive about the state of the nation and immigration, think again. On the local elections... I got a note from someone who said, and I quote, because the BMP aren't standing in my area, I will vote UKIP, even though they don't want anyone who's a member of the party. I nearly choked on my morning cuppa over this one. What a prat. How does voting for UKIP come into it? If there isn't a local candidate, just either mark your paper BMP or don't vote. Let's face it, thousands of Brits and a few of our own supporters simply turn about face concerning voting and bring up every excuse under the sun not to vote. So no BMP candidate doesn't wash with me. You would have to be a huge political party with financially sound, generous and regular donations and a veritable horde of activists who don't hold down any sort of job to stand a candidate in every single local council of every single local area in every single region throughout the UK. No party has ever done that and it's simply not viable in some areas for our party where the membership of that party doesn't even bother to hold or attend meetings or to stand. So the message from me for the next general election is if you want the British National Party to stand a candidate in your region and locale get moving on contacting your local organiser or if there isn't one put yourself forward as an activist and help us put your area on the map. Just whining about no candidates is negative and unrealistic in today's society. As long as some of our members sit and wait for someone else to move, there will be areas that do not have a British National Party candidate, especially in the general election, which costs a great deal of money to put one candidate forward in the first place. On education. And to bring the seriousness of the multicultural situation to the masses, there's a programme on BBC called The One Show, and thank God it's just that. This time I clicked in because it's just before EastEnders, which I follow. I just caught the end of it and guess what? They were promoting a school called the Gadsden Primary School somewhere north of the Thames. This school is the shining beacon in the turban of the free multicultural education system in place in the UK, which was of course brought into a being originally for English children of poor parents who wanted their children given some education. Judging from the ecstatic expression on the faces of the two prepubescent pre presenters, the film showed a 100% immigrant school. Those that were a whiter shade of pale were Eastern European, and their English ability was just as bad. When I was 11, and indeed even when my children were that age, they could speak their mother tongue English in a coherent way. These kids, through no fault of their own, are in a foreign country. English is not their mother tongue, and according to the halting phrases of one Muslim kid, we speak our own language at home and sometimes English, and it showed. Whilst the presenters were almost having an orgasm over the ghastly and halting well-rehearsed gibberish and the wonderful challenges that had been overcome, that is probably having no white indigenous kids that I saw at that school, they brought on two guests, one of whom I already loathe, Lumley, and the other was the head teacher, a Christine Parker, of this anti-cultural snake pit. What happened to the term headmistress or headmaster? Or is it just for fee-paying schools? Or does it denote too much authority for the average downtrodden and persecuted immigrant youngster? She was the sort of woman that I hate. Mealy-mouthed, face like a diseased rice pudding, and an air of sainthood about her that really got on my goat. When one of the presenters, a wispy male, suggested in hushed tones 
that perhaps having such a multicultural presence had discouraged the English-speaking parents from sending their children there. This paragon of the new multicultural school system twittered about challenges supporting the local communities, wonderful multi-language opportunities, blah, blah, blah. At that time, I had my bucket on my lap for ease of vomiting. Apparently, this creep learned Urdu whilst working with the Pakistan Heritage Committee in the mid-80s. She more or less admitted she could see the way that the country and the education system was going and jumped on that bandwagon. Lumley chimed in with a gem her, grandfa her grandfather spoke 13 languages and that languages are being ignored now. Well, not really, Joe, as they're spoken all the time as the norm in English schools, especially in certain areas of the country where there are few white English children to cater to. I always believe when in Rome do as the Romans do, learn their language and speak it as they have to in France, or used to, before the socialist twats got in. Remember, these are primary school pupils, not kindergarten or preschool, and should be speaking good English to fit in with other English students in a normal society. The languages spoken at Gadsden are Punjabi, Urdu, Dari, Gujarati, Arabic, Pashto. Then we have Lithuanian, Polish, Slovakian, Russian, Latvian and Czech. Some German and Portuguese and French, which could be from the French-speaking African countries. And would you believe she has a large waiting list, and I bet they're all from those countries or the progeny of such that we have allowed in over the last 40 years. And we have morons talking about capping immigration. What do you do with the millions already here and breeding? That stable door is wide open, isn't it? On global warming, here I believe is a dichotomy. Like immigration, the opinions are very extreme, the middle road virtually non-existent. On a personal level, and not a party level, I believe there is a form of global warming that has been going on for many years. The Earth has cycles of changes throughout the ages which will go on regardless, but being realistic, you cannot have all the emissions from the so-called emerging nations like India, China, Russia and indeed the US pumping crap into the atmosphere decade upon decade and expect there to be no reaction. And now we have it. Colder winters and seas rising may be passed off as normal or cyclable, and indeed, in a world not inhabited by mankind, these normal changes would occur, but they would not occur so rapidly and with such probable loss of life as we might know it. It stands to reason the dinosaurs lived 150 million years, and in their time there were no humans taking from the earth and not giving back. No huge factories filling the air with filth, no toxic dumps, no nuclear tests, no oil drilling or fracking, no overfishing or overproduction of anything. No deforestization, in short, no mankind. We have only existed on this earth for a very short while, and look at what we've done to our world and climate. You can't say that whilst normal and natural changes happen, we humans have not accelerated that timeline by simply not caring and being ignorant. Now we have the two lobbies, one making a small fortune out of telling people to switch off their lights, use solar panels and erecting those hideous made-in-China wind farms and even getting into Parliament on that ticket. Whilst the anti-global warming brigade are in danger, even more so, of falling into the green lobby laps with a total denial that anything is wrong at all. Whereas obviously there is something wrong and we as humans have contributed to it, even though we might not have caused the cycle of change in the first place. The ozone layer is getting thinner. The ice flows, whether natural or not, are getting more scarce. Our Gulf Stream is flowing away from us, and to deny these changes could be a form of obtuseness and lack of responsibility for actions from many years ago. Of course these factories are still churning out crap, and the Far East now has a history of smog which we had in England due to the coal fires, and which I remember very well. So you can be aware of man-made changes without being a total tree-hugger, vegetarian and more. There will need to have the middle ground on this, as well as immigration or we and the world will not survive long. Further on global warming, there was a clip in the Daily Mail yesterday on a scientist being crushed by a lorry near the Houses of Parliament. Now call me odd, but this very attractive woman, Dr Catherine Giles, 35, was a research fellow and lecturer at University College London and was tipped as a future star in the field of polar studies. And she had already conducted groundbreaking work in the Arctic and the Antarctic. Apparently that particular department has suffered a loss in the past. Its director, Professor Seymour Laxon, 49, was killed when he fell down a flight of stairs on New Year's Day. Call me a fantasist, but do these deaths of these weather scientists seem rather convenient? 
Our government, like all other establishments throughout the world, work in mysterious ways. Dr Giles was crushed in rush hour traffic on Monday as she arrived at a junction in Victoria, as the construction lorry turned left into her path. Even more surprisingly, Scotland Giles said the driver stopped and has not been arrested. Will he even be prosecuted? Well, MI5 or MI6 won't be. So perhaps there's more to the polar ice caps and global warming than meets the eye. And it is either very good or very bad. But someone, somewhere, wants something hushed up. That these two brilliant scientists who dealt with global warming should conveniently meet with accident smacks of the boffin, who apparently bled to death with no blood present around him, because he had information on the WMDs that Hussein didn't have. I smell something very bad in the state of the UK over these cases, but my thoughts are especially for the young woman at the start of what could have been a wonderful career. She should have been a head teacher at a multicultural school, shouldn't she? But then, she'd have still been alive. And finally, a hamster ascension, or nearly. I bet our listeners thought I'd have this one as a finally, and I hate to disappoint. A hamster called Tink apparently died and was raised again on Good Friday, bless her. Lisa Kilborn Smith and boyfriend James Davis were looking after the pet hamster for friends when they found her lying lifeless in her cage. They thought she was dead and wrapped her body in kitchen roll, dug a one foot deep grave in their flower bed and laid her to rest. The pair then phoned Tink's owners, Nicky Gamble and Jamie Wynne, to break the news that the two and a half year old had passed away. But the next day, Good Friday, Mr Davis called back to announce that the hamster had been resurrected after going into hibernation. She'd eaten her way out of her paper shroud, dug her way out of her grave, edged along a narrow wall and then climbed a waste pipe to land in a recycling box. She then crawled into an empty cat food cardboard box which became her shelter through the sub-zero night. Tink was found by Miss Kilburn Smith's father Les the following afternoon as he went to flatten the boxes for recycling and her head suddenly popped out. As well as surviving her burial, the freezing night and being accidentally crushed, the hamster also escaped, becoming a snack for the family's pet cat, Milo. This presenter says, On seeing the video of this little lady, she's lovely, but the one thing to be very wary of is that they do try to hibernate, often impossible with people handling them all the time, but Tink must have given it a go. They're highly intelligent little creatures. Many years ago, my then new hammy escaped whilst her cage was being cleaned out upstairs. She chewed her way through the skirting board and ended up behind the stonework alongside the stone fireplace on the ground floor. We put paper through the hole and she climbed up to freedom. Perhaps in Tink's case, it was the Good Friday message of hope and rebirth. You've been listening to The World at Eight. I'm Lynn Mozart and I and the team at World Date and Radio Britain wish you all a very happy and a very safe weekend.